Paul writes, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and our time of study in it together. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we do thank you for this time together. What a blessing it is to be with your people on a Sunday morning to sing hymns of praise to you and your grace and your mercy and read the scriptures as we've done, consider the meaning of the passage at some length and consider how all of this applies to us in this day and age. That's a great thing to do and it's what we need to do routinely, weekly, as we do on a Sunday morning, but we need to do it daily in our own personal lives as we read scripture and meditate on them. We need to be diligent in doing that because this is what feeds our soul and what transforms us. This is what the Spirit of God uses to sanctify us. And so, Lord, we pray for that this morning. We pray your blessings upon us. We pray that as we study together that our time of study will not simply be that, but it will be a time of worship as well, and you'll draw us close to yourself, and we'll see your greatness and mercy in all the things that we have just read and and how that should motivate us to live the kind of life that Paul has described here in these various parts, these different uh, commands and exhortations that he gives. It's difficult as we look at it. We wonder how can we do the things that he has instructed us to do. And of course we cannot do any of this apart from your grace but there are things that we can do that enable us to do that. And as we reflect deeply upon who you are and what you've done for us, then of course we are moved and motivated to live lives of, of selflessness as Paul directs us to do. So Lord, bless us in many ways. Bless us uh, in the application of these things to our lives and in our conduct, which is itself a great witness for you and your grace. So build us up in the faith in this hour, and we pray that for the hour to come. We pray for uh, the Sunday school class, that you bless all who teach. You may the Spirit of God minister through them and in the hearts of all who listen to open hearts to receive the message that is given and to convict where conviction needs to be felt and to edify and build up in the faith. So Lord, we pray that for uh, all of the classes and meetings this morning. Bless us. Bless us materially. We depend upon you for everything. We pray that you would bless our health, that you would bless our finances, our economic situation for those without work, we pray that you'd bless them with patience and diligence and may they see your hand of blessing. But so many, Father, um, uh, have much, all of us have much to be thankful for. And so we give you praise for what you've given to us and thank you for this time together and pray you'd bless it. Build us up in the faith, we pray. May we praise you for all that we have in Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. When I was young, my father would sometimes say to me, usually on a weekend as I was about to go out, 
We are in the world, but not of the world. It's a Christian proverb that I uh, didn't always want to hear, but it's true. We are in the world, but we're not to be disengaged from the world. We're to be engaged with the world, but we are still to be different from the world. And what could be more different from the world and more enlightening to the world than the instruction that Paul gives in the passage we consider this morning, Romans chapter 12, verses 14 through 21. Bless those who persecute you. Never pay back evil for evil. Never take your own revenge. Overcome evil with good. That is completely contrary to how people normally respond to hostility. Even the rabbis taught the people to love their neighbors and hate their enemies. And we can understand that. And it's natural for us to love those who love us and to hate those who hate us. But Christ said, no, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That is what Paul instructs us to do in Romans chapter 12, verses 14 through 21. It's not natural, but then Paul is not writing to natural men. He's writing to people who have been changed, whose minds have been renewed and are being transformed by the grace of God. That's how Paul began the chapter. We are in the application section of the book of Romans. For 11 chapters, Paul has taught doctrine and explained the life-changing grace of God. Now he instructs us how to live, how to live according to this great grace that he has explained in regard to all of our relationships. First, in our relationship to God. We are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Uh, next to our relationship with Christians, we are to love one another. We considered that last week. And now Paul instructs on our relationship with those outside the church, with the world. We are to love our enemies. That's the subject of this final section of Romans chapter 12. Paul begins, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Something that's easy to read, maybe even to expound, but as John Murray wrote in his commentary on the book of Romans, no practical exhortation places greater demands upon our spirits than that. And that is certainly true. That's true of this verse, that's true of the whole section that we consider this morning. What makes it so difficult is not just the maliciousness of persecution, but also that it is unprovoked and it's unjust. So our tendency is instinctively to react, it's to retaliate, but we're not to do that. In fact, we're not simply to refrain from retaliation, we are to respond positively by blessing them which means actively seek their good by praying for them. Now, if that seems impossible, it's not, not for the child of God. It is what the Lord himself did. He not only taught this principle, he modeled it. As he hung on the cross, having been unjustly convicted of crimes he didn't commit, having been brutally beaten and uh, cruelly mocked, Though he was innocent, he prayed for his enemies. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And if we say, but that's Christ, but that's the Son of God, what would we expect from him? We also have Stephen's example. As he was being stoned, he fell to his knees and he prayed, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. His prayer was effective with, with at least one person there with a young rabbi, Saul of Tarsus, who was actively participating in Stephen's death and was the object, whether Stephen knew it or not, specifically of his prayer. 
Paul knew in a very personal way that the, the right response to persecution sometimes results in great blessing for the persecutor. So as unnatural, uh, even impossible as it may seem, we are to bless those who persecute us. And the resource of God's omnipotent grace is always equal to the hard demands that he places upon us. These uh, Roman Christians would, would need all of the resources of God's omnipotent grace because in a few years after Paul wrote these words, their obedience would be sorely tested when a great fire in A.D. 64 swept through Rome. Nero blamed the Christians and began a horrific persecution of the church. Among other things, he fed Christians to mad dogs and he made them into human torches to light his garden. That's unusual, of course. Persecution may come, but even if it, if it doesn't occur, and, and most of us have not, will not, suffer that kind of abuse, but, but there will be occasions when we do face difficulties, when, when we face hostility in a variety of ways from the world. And we will face that if we are witnesses for Christ, if we're living for Him. When it does happen and we suffer wrong, we are not to retaliate. We're not to curse. We are to bless. We are to love our enemies. That's the lesson, again, of Romans 12, 14 through 21. Paul continues in verse 15 with the command, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. This is often understood to refer to the relations, relationship between Christians, Christians one to another, and certainly that is consistent with our relationship with one another in the church. We are to be sympathetic with each other, but there's nothing in this verse that would require a change of subject from that of the Christian's relationship to those outside of the church, the Christian's relationship to the world. This is how we're to respond to all people, with joy, when joy is called for, and with sorrow, when sorrow is called for. As, as God's people, we are to identify with the weal and woe of the world. Sympathy is a Christian virtue. Though, as the ancient preacher Chrysostom pointed out, rejoicing with those who rejoice is often harder than weeping with those who weep. When people receive what we would like to receive, the reaction is often one of jealousy, not not joy, as it ought to be. Uh, Paul is calling for an unselfish response from us. That's what Paul earlier called love without hypocrisy. That's what we're to show, show to one another, show to all who are blessed. In verse 16, Paul moves from an exhortation to sympathy to one for harmony, be of the same mind toward one another, he says. His instruction refers to harmony among Christians, but the concern here is still for the world. That's the context, that's, that's the, the subject here. And so the world is going to see the way we respond. Uh, outside the church, they're going to see if there's harmony or if there's not harmony within the church. Christians cannot agree on every position. We differ on all kinds of things. We even differ on our interpretations of Scripture. But we should be able to do that, to disagree amicably. But where there must be agreement is in regard to faith in Christ. It is in regard to the cross. It's in regard to that and obedience to our Lord. That agreement will be a great blessing to the world in that it will reinforce the gospel it will promote the gospel, and that is what the world needs to see. That is what the world needs to hear. It needs to hear it from us. It needs to see it reflected within us. So this is still in regard to the church, our 
witness to it. Paul concludes, do not be haughty in mind or do not be proud, but associate with the lowly. Literally, Paul is saying, do not think high things. Do not think high things about yourself. Believers in Jesus Christ are the most blessed and advantaged people in the world. Not necessarily in material things, not necessarily in, in the matters of health, but we have eternal life. We have the Spirit of God within us. We have the mind of Christ. We have the providence of God always working in our favor. There is no one in the world as blessed as we are, but it is all of grace. We can take no credit for who we are or for what we have. And that should make us humble. And that should make us willing to associate with lowly people. We are all made of the same stuff. So who are we to be proud about who we are and what we have? Everything we have is a gift. Everything we have has been given to us. So, there's no place for arrogance, there's no place for cliquishness or snobbery, the desire to be part of what C.S. Lewis described as the inner ring, being on the inside with the best and the brightest. People pursue that and snub those on the outside. That's the snobbery that Paul condemns. Christ cared nothing for the inner ring, for the social ladder, or acceptance and popularity. He was a carpenter. He went to the sick. He went to the poor in spirit. He gathered around himself the outsiders and the outcasts, sinners and publicans. He looked down on no one and lifted up all of those who came to him. Donald Gray Barnhouse uh, illustrates that uh, kind of behavior from Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes when in 1930 he was appointed Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. He moved to Washington, D.C., and he transferred his membership to a Baptist church there. It was the custom in that church to have all new members come to the front of the uh, church and be, uh, be introduced to the congregation in that way. And on that particular day, the, the first person called was a Chinese laundry man named Ah Singh, who had just recently moved to Washington from San Francisco and had a laundry near the church. Well, he came forward and he stood at the far side of the pulpit. As others were called, they took their position at the extreme opposite side of the pulpit. When a dozen had gathered, Ah Singh was alone. Then Chief Justice Hughes was called and he took his place next to the laundry man, saving him from embarrassment and convicting the others of their hypocrisy. Well, that's what we're to be and what the world is to see in us. Love for one another that is characterized by both harmony and humility. This is what the world should experience from us. This is what it should observe in the church. But we should not be so naive as to think that when it sees that when the world beholds harmony within us and love that we have for one another that it's going to love us back because while it might and it might be impressed as Tertullian said the pagans were impressed with the early church for the most part that's not going to be the case and I say that because of what our Lord said he warned his disciples in John 15 verses 18 through 20 of the world's hatred of them. He said, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Well, it hated him, it will hate us because it hates grace. Paul explained the reason for this antipathy earlier in chapter 6, verse 7, where he wrote that the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, 
for it does not subject itself to the law of God. The unbeliever is in rebellion against God. He opposes God. He opposes his truth wherever he finds it. Men love the darkness rather than the light, John said. And that means that Christians can expect that from the world. The Christians can expect uh, uh, double dealing from the world, cheating and persecution. So Paul comes back to this idea of hostility in verse 17. He writes, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Rather than retaliate, we are to respect what is right in the sight of all men. The world has fallen, but it still has a sense of right and wrong. It may not always be honest and fair. Very often it is not honest and fair. It seeks its own and uh, tramples on other people's rights, but it expects honesty and fairness from others. And we Christians should give that. We Christians should be honest in our dealings, generous in our dealings. Uh, that's true in our finances, in the way we earn our money, in the way we use it, uh, both personally and as a church. Paul was concerned about that. Go back to the books of First and Second Corinthians, and, and he, he speaks of that. He's very concerned about the poor saints in Jerusalem, and he takes up a, a, uh, a, an offering for them, a, a collection to help relieve their difficulties, and he speaks particularly of that in 2 Corinthians 8. He's coming to collect that, that they've pledged, and he wants them to honor their pledge, and it's evidently a large sum of money that he's collected from all the churches in Macedonia and Greece. But he took careful precautions about that, and he, he speaks of, of that very thing in 2 Corinthians, of what is be, of being honorable in the sight of men. And he made sure that uh, there was a group of men that had been appointed by the churches to accompany him and look after this money so that he would in no way be, uh, be questioned as to his integrity. And that, of course, is what all of us are to be. We are to be very concerned about appearances and uh, our witness and our reputation. Uh, but Paul's principle here about respecting what is right uh, in the sight of all men, as he puts it, <clears throat> is broad in its application. And it applies to everything from, <clears throat> from our work to our family relationships, to our, our social life, whatever it is, we are to be above reproach with our money, with our relationships, in all ways. Our behavior has an effect on the world around us. It may not be honest, but it expects us to be honest, and we should. It's a witness. And so, Paul writes in verse 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Uh, the Proverbs are, are filled with that kind of advice. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. In other words, avoid harsh words. Don't be provocative. That takes humility. That takes personal restraint, but that's wisdom. It's hard, but that's wisdom. Proverbs 17, verse 14, the beginning of strife is like letting out water, so abandon the quarrel before it breaks out. Don't be a pugnacious kind of person. Be peaceful. Be a peace-loving person. That's what we are to be. We Christians are to be peacemakers, if possible, Paul says. Now, that's not always possible. Some people don't want peace. Or, or they give unreasonable conditions for peace. So it's not wrong to defend oneself, to defend one's reputation, to defend one's, to defend one's property or family. But we, we are never to be the one who provokes hostility. We are to do everything we can to promote peace and have a positive witness. 
again, I go back as I read through these various verses and all the different statements that Paul makes, that statement that Murray made, how what a, what a burden, what a weight this is on us. Th these are difficult things that Paul has laid upon us, but it's true. Um, it's uh, something we must do. We must be peacemakers. Well, war does come, though. It is inevitable, and so Paul concludes the chapter by, again, stating the, the proper Christian response to hostility. Verse 19, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. So, uh, again, Paul comes back to this warning against retaliation or revenge, and he repeats it because settling scores is such a natural response for men. Shakespeare expressed that, uh, I think, very well in his play, The Merchant of Venice, when Shylock, the Jewish moneylender, said, Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands? If not prick, if you, if you prick us, do we not bleed? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. Well, Shakespeare put those words in the mouth of a Jew, but they could be in the mouth of anyone because that is human nature. It is to get revenge. But Christians are different. It's not that we're simply to be different. We are different. And we're not to take revenge. Instead, we are to leave room for the wrath of God. And Paul supports that from the Old Testament, from Deuteronomy 32, verse 25. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So this is not simply a New Testament form of behavior or virtue. This is for, from all of Scripture. God is going to get the revenge. Uh, that's the reason taking uh, vengeance on our part is wrong. It's not that judging is wrong. It's not that it's, it's wrong that uh, those who do evil should be punished. But it's God's prerogative, not ours. We're to leave that to Him. He will right all wrongs the best way, and He will do it in His time. And I think, really, when we want to take revenge, when we want to even the score, however we want to put it, while that's a very natural, even visceral response, it's also a response of a lack of faith because it says, I don't believe that God is going to do this in the right time and in the right way and in the best way. It's a matter of faith to trust Him to do these things. Well, Paul continues quoting the Old Testament in verse 20, from Proverbs 25, verses 21 and 22. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Well, that's another one of those very hard things to do. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Repaying evil with kindness is a way of heaping hot coals on a person's head. Now, I think that statement is clear enough in and of itself. But the meaning of this uh, metaphor, the meaning of this uh, figure, is it, not all that clear. Different interpretations of it have been given. Coals and fire in the Old Testament often refer to God's presence and His judgment. So some have argued that, that what, what this means here is giving food and water to the enemy is the means by which their guilt before God is increased, leading to a more severe judgment. And so there's a sense in which, well, I'll do good, and that's really going to make things worse for them. And no doubt that will be the result of doing such things if there's no positive response on the part of the enemy to the goodness that's been shown. But I don't think that is Paul's meaning here. Christians don't show kindness in order to make judgment harsh. That's not our motive. Um, 
as presented here. Our motive is for good, not for that. <clears throat> it doesn't fit the context either. Paul has uh, repeatedly urged Christians to, <clears throat> to uh, avoid uh, a spirit of retaliation. So <clears throat> most uh, commentators explain the meaning of uh, the coals of fire to be uh, a figure for, as, as, as one person put it, burning pangs of shame or the pain of shame that comes from uh, such a, such a, a gesture. It, it afflicts the conscience. It afflicts that for the purpose of leading to repentance. The, the positive motivation for doing acts of kindness to our enemies is that by them they might come to a knowledge of the truth. By them they might be won to the gospel. Uh, Charles Hodge, the great Princeton theologian of the 19th century wrote that uh, there is nothing uh, more powerful than goodness. And then he, he states, men whose minds can withstand argument and whose hearts rebel against threats are not proof against the persuasive influence of unfeigned love, of genuine love. Well, not everyone is a, is a brilliant theologian. Not everyone is skilled in a debate. We can't all best the unbeliever in a, a discussion of the gospel. And uh, not all of us are great evangelists. But we can all show kindness. And it's encouraging to think that acts of kindness that we do, the things that we do, will be effective, will have a desired result, that they're not empty, and God uses them. And that's His plan, that's His purpose. But again, that's easier said than done, isn't it? What, what can be harder to do than love your enemies than to feed and comfort those who hate you, those who have abused you. And we, we wonder as we think about how can we possibly do that? I can read this and we can say that's what it says. And we can maybe give an eloquent sermon on that, but doing it out there in the street, that's, that's very difficult. Well, how do we do that? Well, Paul may have hinted at what is needed in order that we do what is humanly, seems to us, humanly impossible. He hinted about that back in verse 19 when he said, Never take your own revenge, beloved. Remember, that's what you are. That's who you are, beloved. We are the objects of God's love. And his love, as Paul explained back in chapter 5 and verse 8, is for sinners. He loved us when we hated Him. It's always helpful to remember where we came from and what we have received. We've been forgiven much. And so we are to forgive much. Now, Paul concludes the chapter with the final word of instruction, a, a, a general word of advice. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And that really sums up what Paul is teaching in this passage. When a person pays back evil for evil and takes revenge, he's conforming to the attitudes and actions and standards of this fallen world. He's being overcome by it. He's yielding to it. We cannot embrace evil and not be wounded by it. When we harbor bitterness, when we retaliate, it scars the soul. It hardens the heart. It leaves its mark. It's what we want to do, but we know it's wrong from the Word of God. <clears throat> that in and of itself is reason not to do it. That's the main reason not to do it. But from a practical standpoint, it affects us negatively. It's destructive of our own spiritual life. So instead, Paul urges a positive step. Overcome evil with good. 
respond to evil by doing good. And do that constantly. That's, that's the force of the command that he's giving here. Not just once or twice, but that's to characterize us. And as we do that, it promotes our sanctification. Just as doing evil corrupts our soul, doing good edifies the soul. It builds us up. It strengthens us and changes us for good and enables us to be more responsive in the proper way in the future. <clears throat> David's response to, to Saul is an illustration of all of this. Saul persecuted him unjustly and mercilessly. David said at one point early on, in fact, he said, there's hardly a step between me and death. Saul was constantly after him. If not throwing spears at him, he was chasing him down out in the wilderness. And on one occasion, one occasion, actually two occasions, but the first occasion, Saul was in, within David's grasp. David was uh, hiding in a cave, and without knowing it, Saul entered the cave, and while he was there, David secretly cut off a corner of his robe. Uh, after Saul left, David uh, called out to him from a safe distance. He called him father, told him how close to death Saul was. There was but a step between him and death at that moment. And then he showed him a piece of the robe. And, and in it, he showed him not only that he was close to death, but he showed David's loyalty. No, he said, that there is no evil or rebellion in my hands. And Saul heard this. His conscience was stricken. He said, is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept, and he confessed that he'd acted wickedly, toward him and that David was more righteous than he and he said now I know that you will surely be king you know, that was the whole issue he didn't want David to be king he was rebelling against God's will and that's just a picture of the world and the saints the world and God's people they don't want him to rule over them and they don't want to hear his message from us or see it in us so we have a picture of people of God and the enemy in that. But uh, it happened a second time when Saul was again chasing David. He seemed to have repented, but it didn't last. And he's after him again. And then David and Abishai went into the camp while everyone was sleeping, and they removed Saul's spear and water bottle. When again, David showed Saul their trophies as uh, proof that, that he, that David, could have killed him, but instead spared him, Saul was again convicted. I've sinned, he said. I've played the fool. David repaid evil with good, and he heaped burning coals on the head of the king. Now Saul's heart never really changed. But David became only stronger while Saul grew increasingly weaker. God preserved David, who did well, and in time he judged Saul. God will deal justly with our enemies. That we can know, and we know it by faith. That's what the Word of God promises us. The last Roman emperor to persecute the church was Galerius a fanatic in his opposition to Christianity. But he failed. On his deathbed in great pain, he admitted that he had failed, and he begged Christians for their prayers. They had heaped coals, hot coals on his head. Practicing evil will destroy us. Practicing goodness will build us. So that is how we are to live in this fallen world. We are to love our enemies. We're to bless those who hate us. And while that's hard to do, unnatural and seemingly impossible, this is instruction for people who are not natural, who are different from the world. We have become new creatures. We are a new creation in Christ. 
We cannot do this in our own strength, but we can do it in Christ's strength. That's what the Word of God assures us. Paul assures us of that. In Philippians chapter 4, and verse 13, he said of himself, I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. If that's true for Him, it's true for you. It's true for all of us. As we walk by the Spirit, not according to the flesh, we will live as God wills us to live. So the life Paul urges is not impossible. Not for us. We can live it by God's grace. Paul's instruction here in verses 14 through 21 is summed up in the command, love your enemies. Dr. Johnson wrote, a godly way to get rid of an enemy is to make him a friend. In this way, evil will be overcome by good. That's what the Lord did. He overcame sin with sacrifice and made us his friends. Have you been reconciled to God through Christ? Or are you still living as an enemy? Are you still living under the judgment of God? Judgment will come. It's appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. So if that's you, escape. Come to Christ. Believe in Him. He receives all who do. He forgives sinners and He gives every believer everlasting life and the ability to live as Paul instructs us to live here. May God help us to do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this text of Scripture. It is a very difficult uh, passage of Scripture to, to live. It, um, it does place great demands upon our spirit and they are difficult demands. We look at this and if we're honest with ourselves, we say, I cannot do that. And in fact, I think we would, we would have to admit, I will not do that. That's, that's not your spirit within us. And that's not the, the nature that you have given us. That is the sin that's in us. Help us to overcome that, Father. By your grace and your power, enable us to live the kind of life that we see here. And as it's possible for us to live it in peace with all men and to be a witness to the saving grace that you have extended in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray these things in His name. Amen.